plug. <laughs> right, everybody, welcome to this week's Hangout. I can't believe it's already Friday and time for another Hangout. And we've almost finished another round of F1 testing. This week, we are joined by Stuart Codling, a.k.a. Codders. He's just been trying to do a shameless plug of F1 racing, so that probably explains where he's from. Codders, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, uh, I have nicknamed Codders. Uh, my real name is Stuart, uh, so I'm Codling, and yeah, I'm the deputy editor of uh, F1 Racing Magazine in the UK. Uh, people uh, watching this in other parts of the world might have a different mugshot in the beginning of their issue because we've got about 20 foreign editions in umpteen languages all over the world. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Collars. I know it's uh, a difficult time to come and join for an hour or so on a Hangout, so thank you very much. We are very appreciative. And we've got lots of people on the Hangout today as well. We've got Philip, who we've never had before. So, hi, Philip. Do you want to just say a couple of words about yourself? Yes, hello, everybody. I'm Philip Georgievich. I'm uh, calling you from Novi Sad in Serbia, and Ooh. I'm just a regular Formula One and Ferrari fan, as you can maybe see about my T-shirt. And uh, yeah. I'm a little bit crazy fan about the statistics and history of Formula One as well. Well, we love a crazy fan and we like a Ferrari fan, so uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Mollis or Christian, uh, would you like to introduce ourselves? We know, we know that you're very, very active on all our uh, YouTube videos, we see you commenting a lot, but thank you very much for joining us. Quick little introduction from you, Mollis. Um, yeah, my name is Christian, um, aka Mollis. Uh, I come from Denmark and I recently won the Lotus competition, so that's all good. Woohoo! Um, oh, the cat made it to you. This is good yeah. news. I like that. Um, well, well done. Thank you very much for entering. It proves to everybody that we do send out those prizes that we promised to you all. Um, thank you so much for joining us from Denmark. That is cool. Thank you. We're getting a very international crowd. I'm loving this. Um, we've then got uh, Scott. How are you doing, Scott? We know you. Yes, you know me. Yes, hello. Um, 23 years old, aspiring to be a motorsport commentator. I claim to know what I'm talking about most of the time, but um, that's fine. I love me a bit of 80s and 90s motorsport, so ranging um, from a various kind of spectrum of things and um, very involved in uh, online motorsport, online sim racing, did a lot of commentary there as well, and uh, been really good experience. And uh, of course, I love the pole position guys and uh, all the great oh. stuff they do, so uh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, pie, I'm just pining to get some favour here. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, thank you so much. You're very kind, and uh, you do know what you're talking about. Don't just claim to know what you're talking about. Um, so we all know who each other are now. This is good. Um, I wanted to start uh, by asking Codders a question. We are nearly at the end of the second round of testing out in Bahrain. We've got one more day left. What do you think? we can take away, or how can we sum up where Formula One is at the moment, going into the new season, bearing in mind we're over halfway of the testing overall now? Well, I think it's in quite a healthy place, actually. You know, you think back to before the start of the season, and people were speculating that the cars were going to be slow, uh, they were going to be blowing up all the time. Mm, uh, <laughs> some of them have been. But um, I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely Healthy. Some of the team principals might say that the uh, new engine package is costing them an awful lot of money and uh, it kind of makes a mockery of the whole sackcloth and ashes thing we've had to do with uh, being seen to save money. But I think it's been an interesting technical challenge and uh, from what I've heard, um, my boss is uh, over in Bahrain at the moment uh, for the test, uh, interviewing Nico Hulkenberg for the next issue of the magazine. He's Ooh. been out on track. He says they look and sound great, and although the noses look funny on photos, apparently in the flesh, it, it doesn't look so bad at all. Just a quick one on that, Connors. Which is your favourite design this year? Which one's caught your eye the most? Uh, which one's poked me in the eye the most? <laughs> uh, probably, uh, asking. Uh, I quite like the McLaren one. Uh, for me, the Mercedes is probably the best looking one. Uh, it, it's quite interesting that uh, in the Jerez test, the technical director of Ferrari, James Allison, said that the nose isn't actually a, a hugely critical part of the car, which is why you've seen all these peculiar solutions. I, I think the caterums is the most outlandish. It kind of looks... Um, I don't like know. it's got two parts, almost, isn't it? Yeah, that sort of yeah, it, jutting it, out. it reminded me of the, uh, the Ferrari that Jody Schechter won the 1979 yeah, yeah, World Championship with. Um, I was down up at Laverstoke Park Farm the, the other week, actually, to, for oh. a feature with Jody, and he has his winning car there. 
he does indeed. Did you try the mozzarella? I did. I went away with a few balls of mozzarella. Um, so Delicious. My, my, wife, my wife's favourite starter is mozzarella, tomato and basil salad. So uh, oh. I, I got mega brownie points for coming home from Laverstoke with those. I bet you did. No, a great place, Laverstoke Park. And, and I paid for them as well. Uh, I know, that's a problem, isn't it? Um, so uh, has anyone else got a question about the noses for Stuart, for Codders? Uh, how about you, Scott? What did you think of the noses? I think for the most part they don't look too bad as anyone makes out. I think there are some outlandish ones. The cage room looks very odd. I think there was a great representation if anyone saw Ted Kravitz on his notebook uh, back in Hereth. He used to, I think it was a pack of saltires and a banana to demonstrate kind of the nose and everything. That's quite intriguing. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's more of an opinion rather than a question, really. It's kind of just, I think that there's a lot about, I think, even the Lotus when it came out on cover, I think everyone everyone looks at the picture and thought, oh, that looks horrible. There's one edge of the nose looks longer than the other. And then I know some friends of mine looked at the nose in the flesh or when it was testing and thought, doesn't look too bad, actually. Um, yeah, I think, it, but again, we, we all had the, when we went to the 2009 with the, with the tall wings, tall rear wings and the big wide front wings and we all thought that's going to look horrible then we kind of got used to that and of course same with the step noses so I think it's just it'll take time I think you know a lot of uh, I think it's we're all trying to adjust to these new rules and regulations we're all trying to adjust the fact the cars look different they sound different they're going to drive different but I think it'll be positive and it's all it's usually when there's a new set of regulations it's always whoever can make the most of those regulations in the beginning for the first couple of seasons they tend to be the ones that are up at the front of the grid and tend to be the ones that benefit the most in our favourites for the championship. Then when you get to kind of, once you have the first two or three years, they want to start to figure out where they are and how they can get the most out of these new regulations. Then we start to see people develop. Um, it's always been like that, and the money's always been able to capitalise that than Adrian Newey. So, yes, there's been some teething troubles, but I think he'll probably, it'll be a case of he'll find it out where the sweet spot is with the regulations, and he'll come bouncing back, I think, in some ways. But, um in per perfect case in point was 2005 when they changed the regulations on the McLaren it was fast but it was fragile that's exactly what the Red Bull is right now it's fast or, or well I don't know how fast it is yet because the Renault Turbo hasn't had a proper chance to, to push but um, we'll have to wait and see I think if they get their reliability up then they'll be up there at the, end of the front but the Mercedes cars have a definite advantage and it's it's pretty obvious that those cars are going to be near the front in the first couple of races until Renault yeah. sort their energy systems out you, uh, yeah. you mentioned the word fragile. I think fragility is a good word. He's got a good knowledge. He's got a great knowledge, hasn't he? <laughs> um, the, um, the, he mentioned the word fragile, and uh, reliability is something we were all talking about in the first round of testing, um, Stuart. But this round is not so much about reliability, and yet there are still, still problems. When can we start not having to focus on reliability and actually seeing the cars demonstrating what might, what might, might happen in Melbourne? Well, until you mentioned the, the M word, I was going to say, around about the time the Hungarian Grand Prix that stopped going. Uh, this was, yeah, this was supposed to be a performance test. You know, the harass was just going to be a pound round and make sure nothing falls off and, and to prove the engines. Uh, and it turned out to, to be very much that. Uh, I'm sure a lot of teams would have hoped that they would have uh, conquered any sort of engine-related problems by now and would be trying to look for performance. And you see some of the teams doing that. Um, McLaren the other day put uh, Kevin Magnussen on a set of super soft tyres to see what he could do, and the answer to that was he could do quite a lot, set quite a quick time. Force India uh, sent Nico Hulkenberg out on some soft tyres to go for a time. He did that pretty well. But then other people just seem to be struggling a little bit, and it's interesting that this week Mercedes have actually gone backwards a little bit in terms of their reliability. They've, they've had a few slips, hiccups and burps um, today and yesterday. So uh, I, I think they're all still learning. We, we might not see this stuff even out, even before Australia. I, I was very surprised, you, you know, trying to get as much mileage on these cars as possible with all the drivers. Williams focusing on pit stops today. Did that surprise you? Pretty unusual, but they had quite a few problems with pit stops last year, if you recall, in terms of the discipline of actually getting the nuts on properly and um, ensuring they didn't fall off. And uh, I, I think they're practicing that. Maybe it, it could be that they were having some sort of car problems and they decided to, rather than just have the car in the garage doing nothing, 
they uh, made use of it uh, to practice pit stops with because I wasn't there. I don't know if he was going out, doing a lap, and then coming in, or whether they were doing the more usual thing, which you, you tend to see on a Saturday afternoon post-qualifying um, with, with, with the spare. Oh, no, it's... It, it's Saturday I, think they, I think they were doing quite a lot of laps because um, Bottas was at the top of the tally at one point for the laps, um, and it looked like they weren't they weren't setting times, but they were going around the circuit. So it was yeah, it was just an interesting use of time. I thought it could be it could be that, but yeah, but very often when when they do pit stop practice um, on on the Saturday, all they do is push the car back and then they basically push it forward onto they run it. Run it in, don't they? They run it through. They, they don't kind of drive out and, and round. But yeah, I, I think I think Bottas did about 55 laps today without setting a time, which mm. is um, which is bizarre. So it, frustrating. It's what frustrating for him. Uh, you know, they they they're running to their own program, and uh, every team has a different plan. And without actually being privy to what that plan is, it's tricky for us from the outside looking in to know uh, what, what they're actually doing. All, all we can tell is that some of them are struggling, and Red Bull today, uh, once again, packed up early. They said it was a car problem rather than an engine problem, but I think they've become very conscious over the past couple of days that there's a little bit of a schism developing between them and Renault, where some of their quotes, some of the quotes they've made have been spun up by some elements of the media to be critical of Renault, and Renault are kind of taking a couple of paces back, and they're quietly briefing the media to say, oh, well, actually, you know, our engine's fine, but you know, we'd learn more about how it worked if the teams that are using it actually got out and did some laps. So it's been quite interesting to see what's been a championship-dominating partnership, the Red Bull-Renault thing, over the past four years, just kind of having a few not quite irreconcilable differences, but just all of a sudden you, you can see some fault lines developing there. And interestingly with Lotus obviously re-signing with Renault, extending their partnership, was that a surprise? Did you think perhaps people would be a bit reticent to keep getting into bed with Renault with all these problems coming out of the woodwork? I don't, well, the, the Lotus car was designed with the Renault engine in mind. I think the only reason for the late announcement of the partnership being signed was that they probably only just got the money to pay Renault for the engines because they seem to be a little bit behind with their bills <laughs> recently. Uh, yes, slightly tricky situations for Lotus at the moment. Do you think, with all the speculation about them not even managing to make it to Melbourne, do you think that's ever going to happen? Do you think there is a risk of them not turning up and not being ready? Well, they were barely there last year, and I, I know that seems like an incredible thing to say when you can And then he went and won. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, Kimi, Kimi Raikkonen and won the race. But there was talk at Melbourne last year that they had very few spares. They hadn't been paying the subcontractors, so the subcontractors weren't building the carbon fiber bits. So if either of the cars had had much of an accident, there wouldn't have been the parts to repair the cars and they might not have been able to start. And um, they're very much living hand to mouth at the moment. Um, to use another cliche, robbing Peter to pay Paul. You see the the the, the, the bailout money from this mythical quantum investments limited the, the Middle Eastern money never showed up. Yes, it's more limited than the... <laughs> yeah, yeah change the post, uh, but uh, it never quite arrived. Uh, they, yeah, they, they are living hand-to-mouth. They have had financial troubles. They've had to make a few staff redundant, and they've also had a lot of natural shrinkage through people leaving to go to other teams. So we might see them, even if they do manage to start the season. And I, I, I imagine they will be uh, on the way to Melbourne. Uh, the question is how much they will be able to develop that car because at, at the moment they've, they've come to Bahrain with with a car that looks fairly finalised whereas the, the other teams who rolled out for the first time in Jerez just had fairly plain wings that were launch spec. The, the Lotus looks a bit more advanced. Um, talking about Lotus, Christian, you've won our lovely Lotus cap that was signed by Romain Grosjean. Christian, you're a big fan of Lotus? Well, I'm kind of a big fan of them. Um... But, but they're not my, my favourite. Not your favourite. What do you think of the pairing with Grosjean and Maldonado? Well, I think they're going to need a lot of spares. They're going to need a lot of spares. They're going to need yeah. even more money than any of the other teams, unfairly. Um, so um, if we go back, we were talking about Mercedes earlier. Um, Lewis Hamilton, obviously fastest today. Codders, do you think that um, Mercedes are actually leagues ahead of the other teams or do you think they just got there quicker and the rest of the teams will get to that level or do you think they are going to be the ones uh, on the top step of the podium at most races? 
Well, at the moment, the car works, which is... Uh, I don't really Always know a bonus. <laughs> I'm not even half joking anyone when I said that you know, to finish first, first you've got to get out of the garage. And, and they've certainly been reliable so far, and, and it seems to be brisk. But you know, the, the caveat there is that not everyone is running as, as, as quickly as possibly they might be able to. And certainly the, the Renault engines we hear aren't running anywhere near full power simply because they can't. They, they just don't have the reliability. They're suffering a lot of vibration. So apparently when, when you go out on the circuit, you listen, the Renault sounds very different to the way the Mercedes sounds. And what's happened is that Mercedes have basically started with a clean sheet with this engine because it's, it's not a case of having an engine with various bits bolted onto it, a turbo, a, a big battery, and the energy recovery system. All, all of those elements have to work in harmony because you can use the energy that's been harvested to spin the turbo faster because obviously you know, a, a tur with a turbo you get lag because um, the thing basically has to spin. The, the exhaust gases drive a pump that uh, compresses the inlet air to make power and that doesn't happen until it's spun. You, so you can use the energy store to make that spin, you get the power faster. So there's all these little subtle things that can interplay with one another. And, and that's what's made the engine development um, so sophisticated and required a, a lot of investment. And the talk is that Mercedes, um, as an engine manufacturer, have got that process very right. Ferrari not very far behind, because we've seen the Ferraris running reliably and heard a lot of good things about that. I think the key thing with the Mercedes is that its cooling requirements uh, are, are not too great. And if, if you look at the Renault cars, uh, or Renault powered cars rather, they all have quite big bulky side pots because of the size of the radiators they've had to fit. Whereas Mercedes have taken a little bit of a hit, they've moved some of the cooling over to the intercooler, so they enclose it in a water jacket, kind of like a tube around the intercooler. And that's taken a lot of the bulk from the radiators, which has enabled them to make the side pods smaller. So there it kind of in a much more advanced state of development with that. It's, it's interesting. Apparently, um, so someone was saying that Mercedes think that Force India have got a slightly better way of, um, of, of cooling the engine than they have, and they've been looking at the Force India slightly enviously. Oh, that's interesting. Well, Hulkenberg was setting some good times in, uh, in Herat, wasn't he? Do you think he's one to watch? He was so, showing such promise at Salba in the mid-part of the year last year. Yeah, he, he's, he's one of those people who seems to change jobs um, at exactly the wrong time. He, so he seems to specialise in being at the wrong place at the wrong time, doesn't he? You know, he left Force India to go to Salba just as Force India were on the up and Salba were on the down. Uh, and now hopefully that won't happen again. And he's got a great amount of potential. His only problem this year is that he's quite a tall guy, so that makes him quite heavy, and they haven't increased the minimum weight of the cars enough to cope with that. So he's going to have the technical director of uh, Force India telling him to lose weight as often as possible, and he's going to be saying, uh, <laughs> but boss, I like the fairy cakes. Uh, if you actually look at some of these drivers, a lot of them, even Max Chilton, who I interviewed for uh, da, 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 da. Uh, a few weeks ago, is looking quite gaunt. You know, and he's, he, he, it's not like he was giant haystacks even last year, but he's lost a few kilos over uh, over the winter, and you, he looks like you could snap him with a twig if if, if you weren't careful. Well, I was talking to Marcus Ericsson at the launch um, up at Caterham, and he was saying he wasn't able to eat really anything over Christmas. He was really worrying about his weight. So it's a big thing for the guys. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have a quick flick through to see if I can get a little picture of... So was that a flick through? Was that F1 Racing you were flicking through there? Was that F1 look, at, look, at him, look at him there. Um, handsome fellow, but you notice kind of... Quite chiseled. Yeah, he's, he's, he's lost it around here. And mm. um, uh, um, we may have done a little bit of photo return, but... Yeah, you can see that. Yeah, um, it's not Photoshop. Those are his real cheekbones. And, yeah, he's, um, he's looking he, thin. He did look. He, he, he looked skinny. And like I said, you know, a gust of wind could snap him in two. <laughs> um, talking of people changing jobs, we had the announcement. Obviously, Charles Peake joining Lotus. Again, interesting one to be joining when there's not much money floating around. What's your thoughts? What about David Valsecchi? Poor him. What's he going to be doing now? Not lurking around the pit lane. 
let's call a spade a spade. Balsecki is not much cop. And <laughs> oh, you surprised me, Colin. Yeah, uh, there was. Uh, I, I, I think he can drive a car quickly, but what uh, his main problem is uh, what's up here or what uh, isn't up there. Because uh, the, when when he was testing the Lotus last year, one one test session, they told him, okay. David, you've 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 done done the three laps, and now we want to come back and check the data. So um, come back in. Are you are you deaf, boy? And they have to hold the thing out, saying, "Come in, come in, come in." And then he goes, "Oh, I was just enjoying myself too much." He's, oh, yeah. poor guy. He doesn't get much nice professionalism in this era. So yeah, um, fast. So not not a big loss. Not a big loss to Lotus or F1 yeah. there then. David. And you know, clearly he's run out of money. And um, what? Charles Peake does bring is money which they need and it's a bit of a shame you know year year on year you see in Formula One these a lot of these reserve drivers who basically just sit around um, in team kit never really doing much and that's basically because the team are taking their money and, and not giving them much at all you used, you used to see people like Sakon Yamamoto, Adam Kahn, people like that who just didn't have a hope in hell of getting a, a drive but they um, they would just sort of hang out and look a little lonely in the paddock and it, it's yeah, quite drifting around don't they just yeah drift. basically being milked so you know you've, you've seen the matrix haven't you when there's all that the, the, the big wide shot of all the pods with all the people who are plugged into it uh, and whatnot it's basically like that all of these, these some of these teams just plug into these drivers wallets it's really them fine and jettison them uh, at the end of the year yeah, and it's very obvious, isn't it? Let's be honest. Um, talking of Charles signing as a, a reserve driver, we've also had the news that Simona Del Silvestro is joining Sauber as an affiliate driver. Girls in F1, boys, I'm going to ask you this, and don't be afraid to say what you feel. I won't be offended. I'm not planning on joining any team soon. Uh, what about you, Philip? What do you think about girls making it as F1 drivers? I think it's a good, uh, good um, because we... Uh, for, Formula One is now losing fans because of the dominance of Sebastian Vettel, maybe, and uh, the change of the rules and everything is going on. And I think maybe uh, girls coming to Formula One will be something to uh, pop up fans to, to start watching again, and maybe girls also. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Getting more fans involved, a, a wider audience. What about you, Christian? What do you feel about girls? Do you think they've got what it takes to be a driver? Yeah, I think they do because, of of course, it's difficult to drive the cars, but it's not as difficult as it used to be. Um, and I think it might be good to to give a wider audience of the of F1. That's not just a mere. Absolutely, and obviously we've already got Susie Wolf there as well, so she's being joined by Simona. What, what about you, Scott? What do you feel about girls in F1, or girls in motorsport in general, like Danica Patrick, for example? Absolutely. Um, I shared the view of a very good friend of mine, um, Jake Sanson. I'm part of his Downforce UK radio network, and he, I've thanks to him, I've become a very big advocate of females in motorsport. I mean, I remember there was that quote that Sterling Moss came out with saying, you know, that girls don't have the mental capacity to you know last in motorsport they haven't got the the mental capacity or whatever it was the ability to drive a proper car quickly you have to look back and think well if that's the case how did Michel Mousson become vice champion in world rally championship in 1982 how did Danica Patrick leave the Indy 500 and win an Indy car race how have how have they gone through the, the ranks how are they now female drivers coming through and doing incredibly well in forms of motorsport I mean it's you know there I think what it's what's good is that having that incentive there and it, it's obviously female drivers. Obviously, they, they get influences from either watching Formula One. I think it's easier to influence, if you see what I mean here. I think it's easier for a, a guy to be influenced by by motorsport rather than female. It's because, of course, you know, it, it, it's. I think it's, you know, it, it, unless there's something to do with the like family or they, go, you know, they they're interested in motorsport themselves. To... Yeah, it, that's what I'm trying. I'm, try, I'm trying to word it the proper way without possibly offending any. I suppose, I suppose <laughs> if, you, if you take it right back to being little children, you know, boys always yeah. play with tractors and girls play with Barbies or whatever. Exactly. So essentially, if, if you follow that stereotype, yes, it's difficult for a girl to be like, actually, mommy and daddy, I'd like to play with cars. So um, yeah. I see what you mean. That's what you're. I think that's what you're driving at there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's it's. But you know, I think once you get in, once you get into it, I think there's no reason why females can't be up there. I mean, I was. 
you know, it, it, on all levels of motorsport, there's, there's fantastic female carters, there's um, females who race you know, all, on the oval track stuff in the, around the UK. There's, uh, I know there's a girl called Laura Tillett who's done, who's done some single-seater racing over, I think it's the MRF, and also the uh, Formula 3 racing as well. So she's coming through single-seaters. Um, there's girls who've won championships in the lower formulas. There's people like Alice Powers come through. It's just that there's no reason. You've got a big why black book there. I, uh, I see you, you note all the girls have got it names down. Um, Damn it! Connor, I've, 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 I've been I've been found out. <laughs> Connors, just, what I've about been, you? <laughs> what about you, Connors? What do you think of girls in motorsport? Do you think it's something we're going to see a lot more of in the coming years? Well, you know, we, time moves on, and certainly time has moved on quite a lot since uh, Sterling Moss was a boy, and. Um, <laughs> He was chasing crumpets, as he likes to. Yes, he loves that word. <laughs> all the ladies. Well, you know, I think you know to 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 take take the go go from, go from the top from the men are from Mars, women are from Venus point of view. I think there are basic differences between the genders in terms of perception of risk. Um, in as a general thing, obviously that there are exceptions. Yeah. But I think that's why you don't see quite so many. Well, one of the reasons why you don't see so many women trying to make it in motorsport because they have a different perception of, of risk just naturally through um, evolution. And also, th there are other limiting factors. I, I don't think they're taken seriously enough. They never get a chance, um, and, and so the opportunity is removed. So that, that's, that, that's another of the legs. You, know, you have fewer people looking to get involved, and then of the those fewer people who try to get involved, they find it harder to attract sponsors because sponsors think, you know, what is it? And, and it all adds up to quite a glass ceiling. So you get a few drivers, a, a few female drivers who show potential and, and are pretty good, but they never kind of take the, the they, they never get the opportunity to take the next step because they don't get the level of investment that's required. And it's, it's interesting to talk about people like Alice Powell, who's competed very successfully in Formula 3, uh, and, and to sort of think, uh, how, how much further is she going to be able to go? Because to, to take the next step is going to take money, uh, unless um, she wins a championship that has a prize pot, and then she can use that money to, to go up. Uh, I think history is littered with what I would say is that there are wealthy female participants who have um, bought their way in the same way that a male pay driver would, and they have kind of, I, I think they've harmed the cause of women in, in motor racing more than improved it. So you look back 20 years to Giovanna Amati, who, if she was a bloke, she'd have been slow. It didn't matter that she was a woman, she was just a wealthy person who bought a drive. Uh, and that went back, you, you can look back as far as the 1950s, and Maria Teresa de Filippis, who drove a few Grand Prix in a Maserati 250F. Um, she was just a, a wealthy person who tried hard, and uh, fair play to her, you know, she, she was not best fastest, but she didn't injure herself or anyone else. And in those days, there were a lot of people who were wealthy who went motor racing and who wrote themselves off. You know, you know people like Carol Godin de Beaufort checked his Porsche off at the Nürburgring and wrote himself off very, very promptly. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think until we find ourselves in a scenario where female drivers are taken seriously enough to gain the sponsorship, to get the seat time, to get the experience, to make the most of their potential, we won't be seeing that many through it. And, and hopefully Simone Del Silvestro will uh, be able to get seat time rather than... I, I, I'm always a bit dubious when I see people being called an associate driver or something. Mm. I'd like to think that they're not just taking her money and not giving her an opportunity because that would be very tragic. She's raced very successfully in IndyCar and she's uh, she's a tidy driver. She does have potential and, and unless she actually does get a fair crack of the F1 whip, we will just never know. Yeah, she's got high hopes. She's saying that 2015 is going to be the year she's aiming for. So, I mean, that's that's next year. It's not far away, so... Do you think that could happen? Do you think 2015 could be the time you might see her out and about? Hopefully. I, I think she needs to not spend 2014 on the sidelines hoping for a, a, a drive to drop from the sky. I think you need, you, what, what you need is seat time uh, and experience driving the machinery. So uh, once again, like I said, you know, the, the O word, opportunity. And uh, I, I think she, you know, she's gone part of the way to creating the opportunity because she's signed up with Sauber. She just needs to keep pushing at the door and hopefully eventually it will open. 
And Salva obviously has set up so many of these uh, incredible F1 drivers we see their careers. So uh, she's in the right place if she wants the launch pad. Yeah, well, their uh, their wind tunnel was paid for by Kimi Räikkönen, or rather, the, it was paid for by the money McLaren paid them to take uh, Kimi Räikkönen before his contract had expired back in the day. Well, you, you talk about McLaren. I was wanting to go back to that. When we're, we're talking about testing. Let's go back to testing. Um, McLaren last year, absolutely horrendous. We'll write that all off. Um, had you expected them to be this reliable and this quick so early on in the season after having sort of to get everything together after last year's nightmare? No, although they did, uh, they, they canned development of last year's car midway through the season to concentrate on this one. So in, in that respect, it's not surprising that they've made some progress with it. Uh, to my mind, the interesting thing is it looks very different from previous McLarens. So they've done a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. And, and yeah, they, they've done pretty well. Uh, when you consider that, obviously, their relationship with Mercedes is becoming a more separate one, even more so this year, now that they've signed up with Honda for 2015, um, that there is, there is a, more than a Chinese wall between them and, and, and Mercedes, who used to own part of the company. So, yeah, they, they've, they've done extraordinarily well. But, of course, like I said, it's very easy to bolt on a set of super soft tyres and set the fastest time of the day uh, when no one else is trying to do that. Very true. But with Magnussen, I hadn't expected him to be challenging Jensen so much. Well, actually, I, I sort of had and I sort of hadn't. I sort of hoped that Jensen might be, be stronger because, obviously, being a little bit more of a... A mature student, shall we say, in the on the grid. But, <laughs> but um, will you have you been impressed by Magnussen? Yeah, Kevin is very different from his dad. Um, it's interesting when they when he pulls his crash helmet off, uh, the eyes he, he looks, he's an absolute spitting image of his dad. It's a bit like Prost, isn't it? When you look yeah. at uh, Nicola. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, like his father. and da Damon Hill and his father, mm. and um, Bruno Senna and Ayrton Senna. Ayrton, sorry. Ayrton. Um, Ayrton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, but that is the only thing Kevin Magnussen shares with his dad. He's very intelligent and very focused. And uh, the thing with Jan Magnussen was um, he was very brave, he was quick, but um, he kind of lacked motivation. And there's a very, uh, there's a sort of, I won't say a famous story, but that there is an anecdote of when Jan Magnussen was driving for Jackie Stewart and routinely getting his backside kicked by Rubens Barrichello. Uh, Jackie Stewart took Jan to one side, sat him down with a laptop and said, uh, sh shall I do the Jackie student person? Hey, 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 now Jan, if you look here, look at your telemetry and you, you compare with what you're doing with Rubens and I, I want you to sit down and uh, and look at where you're slower than Rubens. And I'm, I'm starting to not be Jackie Stewart. Right, I love that. Just I love that. It. We Jackie. We the, Jackie. The gist of it. <laughs> The gist of it was that he told Jan to sit down with his laptop with the telemetry on it and learn from his mistakes uh, where he was losing out in terms of time to Rubens. And he left the room and heard click, 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 click on the keyboard and thought, oh, great. He's um, obviously, you know, he's working really hard on this. Went back in 10 minutes later. He was playing Minesweeper. Uh, and that is uh, sadly where... Jan Magnussen went wrong. He, he didn't apply himself. Kevin Magnussen is a completely different cookie. He's had his father's had very little input in his career. Actually, if you say um, if you try and talk to him about his father, he'll kind of give you slightly short shrift. He'll say, "Well, actually, my uncle uh, has supported my career a lot more. My father's been busy with his own career." So Kevin is very focused and very intelligent. And uh, the season before last, he made a lot of mistakes in Formula Renault 3.5. He was fast, but he crashed a lot. And he basically sat down, had a word with himself, realised that he needed to drive more intelligently as well as quickly to succeed. And we saw in, in the 2013 season, he did just that. He wrapped the championship up with a weekend to go. I think he's, he's very good at his feedback, isn't he, as well, of giving the teams what he wants to, to change and set up and stuff as well. Yeah, the, the, the Formula One is such a data-driven sport that a driver has to be able to come back and communicate effectively with his engineers because the cars are producing enough data for a whole team of people to sit down and take a week to go through. So in, in, in the environment of a race weekend where you have uh, a nine, one 90-minute session at the beginning of the Friday to 
just start off with your program and then a short gap, then another 90 minute session and then the next day you've just got one more hour of practice before qualifying starts. That gives you very little time to work with your engineer and, and just go through the way the car's behaving and it's not enough to say um, Sergio Perez style, uh, car's understeering here or oversteering there. Well, you know, they can tell that from the telemetry. They need to know a lot more. They need to know more subtle things about how the car's behaving. So you think he's a definite step up from Perez then, would you say, with Magnussen? Yeah, the, the team were a little bit disappointed with Sergio. They they found that he, he basically sat in the car and didn't know how the steering wheel worked, uh, so, so we're told. And they were saying, what, 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 did, what did they teach him at Sauber? There, there were a few things he was quite behind on. And they, they sort of felt that he blew hot and cold, and so sometimes he would be able to he'd put in a few fast laps, but he wasn't able to push Jensen consistently. What they found when Jensen was driving against Lewis, uh, when they were teammates, sometimes Jensen would not be able to get the most out of the car until Lewis had gone quicker and he'd go, oh, I can brake later there, I can do this, I can do that. He could then replicate that. And uh, what they need is, is someone quick in the garage next door in order to, for Jensen to get the best out of himself mm -hmm. because on a dry track, um, he, he does need that impetus. It's very strange. On, on a wet or damp or greasy track, uh, he can find the limits so much better than anyone else. But w when the limits are that much higher, some, sometimes he struggles. Are you talking about Jensen? And, and obviously, congratulations to Jensen and Jesse for getting engaged. Very exciting. Um, do, you, oh, <laughs> do you think he is feeling more pressure then with this youngster, sort of a whippersnapper coming up, setting some great times? The sad thing with his daddy obviously passing away. This is, everyone's saying he's got a sort of lucky seat in F1. Do you think he's feeling the pressure? <laughs> I, I, I'd like to think that he isn't. I think he's he's certainly he'd grown up a lot over the years. You know, when when he came into Formula One, he was very young. He had lots of people. Uh, that, as as happens when you're successful when you're young, you very quickly develop an entourage of people who say yes to everything, and rather like Justin Bieber. Uh, and um, which is, is the, about the end of the comparison we'll draw between them. But yeah, uh, yeah the. And, and as you said, let's get, let, let's go back to Justin Bieber. Actually, surrounded by people saying yes, you know, do this, do that, and what what happens is you end up blowing your career quite quickly and um, getting busted by the cops for racing in Miami in a in a Lamborghini. And yeah. in his younger career, Jensen got quite distracted by the the fame and fortune. And it was only after he had a few terrible years in uncompetitive cars that he kind of found a a lot of inner strength and it was only when he kind of reached the bottom that he found the mental strength to go back up to the top and I, I don't think he's resting on his laurels I think he's, he's fitter and stronger than he ever was he, he, since taking up triathlons he's become very mentally focused and even more competitive than he used to be and, and he, he's, he is very focused on his craft but like you say there will be pressure not good pressure having someone quick in the garage next door because with, with McLaren at least, it's not a case of there being a number one and a number two driver. They both want to have, uh, well, well the driver wants, the, the team wants both their drivers to be successful, so they do share data. The, I think the main impact on him is his support network, because his, his dad was um, Team Button, basically, and whereas other drivers now come with an entourage, and Jensen used to have an entourage. For the past few years, he's just been him, occasionally Jessica, uh, his PA, Jules, and his dad, and that's all he's needed. And basically, his, his dad was like a rock, lovely bloke, always had a smile on his face and a friendly word for everyone. And I think he kind of anchored Jensen, and uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll see how he copes without his dad around. Yeah, I think it will be quite a big hole, I think, that will be needed to be filled there. Um, Australia, though, is is a circuit that Jensen likes. So do you think if he can get himself in the right mindset, do you think he could be a dark horse for Melbourne? He's won there before and um, in, in iffy conditions and, and in good conditions. It's it's a very different circuit because because of its nature. It's a little bit stoppy-starty. It's almost like a big go-kart track. So it's... It's a it's a circuit where sometimes you you see things happening that aren't replicated at, at other Grand Prix simply because you, you're just driving round and round a lake and occasionally meeting a chicane. So it makes different demands on the cars. You need the cars sort of set up fairly stiff 
um, because they need to change direction quickly. There's lots of chicanes where it's stop, left, go, and then and then off, which is a, a, a different set of demands than say you'd get at um, even Malaysia or China, where where the, the sort of more subtle technicalities required. So who knows? Maybe Jensen could be up there. Maybe not. Um, I'm going to open up the questions. Uh, Scott, have you got a question for Codders? Uh, let's have a think. Don't worry if you haven't. <laughs> um, I guess as we're talking about McLaren, we're we'll talking about Kevin Magnussen. Um, I want to get your thoughts also, Connors, on Stoffel Vandal because I think he's an exceptional talent. I think that um, the fact that he's in GP2 with ART is fantastic. I mean, his raw speed, he smashed that record at Abu Dhabi at the GP2 test in the last year. Do, do, do you think there's a good chance that when... Button Jensen eventually moves on and say it calls Tommy's F1 career that it is going to be Magnussen and Van Dorn at McLaren? A very good question. And to my mind, uh, Stoffel is being queued up as a potential replacement for. Um, well, he, he, was, he was basically loaded and ready to go in case um, Kevin sank rather than swam. And if and when Jensen calls time in his career, you know, we'll see how Jensen goes this year. If 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 he struggles this year, the team uh, might start to think, well, you know, we'll we'll have a word. We'll have to see what how Stoffel performs this year. But he's an interesting case because he's a driver who came up through the ranks without very much support, and he has had to win championships. So he's he, like most racing drivers, he wants to win. But um, unlike a lot of them, certainly the wealthier ones, unlike, say, Marcus Ericsson, who spent four years in GP2 not winning much, Stoffel has had to win every championship he's been in for the past four years because only by winning the prize pot has he been able to carry on his career. If he didn't win at each stage of the ladder, then that would have been it. He'd, he'd have gone. So for him, motor racing was an and um, still is an up or out business, and he knows that. So um, I, I think he's got a great deal of potential, and he's been spoken of very highly by some quite influential people. He was introduced to McLaren by Alex Wurtz, who used to be the McLaren third driver, and Stoffel was in the FIA Institute for Young Driver Excellence, or whatever its official title is, which Alex Wurtz was uh, an instructor and a mentor. He was very impressed with Stoffel and so Stoffel started sending him his race reports by email and Alex forwarded those on to McLaren's director of communications and sporting director and after a, a few bouts of thinking what on earth is this junk in my inbox they started to read it and said, oh, actually he's not so bad um, he was introduced to them they were very impressed by him he is very impressive he's, he's very sort of straightforward, um, uh, focused, but he talks well, um, seems quite intelligent as well as fast. So um, McLaren took him on in their young driver program. And so, yeah, they're, they're expecting great things from him, and provided he delivers the goods in GP2 this year, uh, which is by no means um, a given because ART haven't been brilliant at looking after their tyres over the past few years. Dan's have uh, been the better team to be with. Um, for, for the past couple of seasons. So so we'll see if in sort of uh, 10 or 11 months' time uh, we're talking about Jensen Button cruising off into the sunset and retirement and Stoffel van Dorn taking on that other McLaren seat. Talking I will say, so I will say very quickly, just one thing for Collins yeah. as well. Nick, if you get a chance to speak to Stoffel, I will say one thing. Ask him about his time sim racing because I know he's a very big advocate of the online kind of stuff and he is, has won a few championships that's on that side. So if you get a oh, chance to speak know. to him. Do, uh, do have a chat about that. I'm sure I'll be happy to talk about it. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. It, it's sad to think, isn't it, that if Stoffel came in and Jensen left, it would be missing out on Honda for Jensen, which you'd think he'd want to be around for when those Honda engines come back. <laughs> if, if they're any good. And, yeah, true, um, true. Yeah. There, there, there have been whispers and gossip, but um, at the moment they are a little bit behind and they're struggling. So someone told me that they had uh, started out with basically a develop a, 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 fiddle, a fiddled with version of the V6 turbo that they ran in uh, 1988, and sort of taking the basic layout of that and then bolting a few little bits on. And um, it sounds precarious. <laughs> but this, this is just gossip and. 
journalist gossip and sometimes people make stuff up to sound better informed than they are. Uh, no. what, what thing you know about Honda is they do, I, I own a Honda motorcycle, it's got a great engine and um, I have owned Honda motorcycles for 10 or 12 years now. Um, the engines have always been fab, they know how to bolt something together, it's something they take pride in. So if they don't get it right straight away, they will get it right eventually, which is what happened the last time they got involved in, in Formula 1 doing turbo engines. If you remember in the early 80s, the Williams Hondas used to disappear regularly in a puff of smoke, and uh, by sort of 1985, 86, 87, um, there was nothing that could touch them. Mm. I know, I was actually talking to someone who works at McLaren, who will remain nameless, uh, yesterday, and he was saying that uh, the thought of everyone driving Hondas instead of Mercedes uh, going forward is going to be a bit of a shock to the system for the staff there. There may be some deaths. Uh, there might be some, like, yeah, the thought of cruising in a Civic. I, I, don't think, I don't think people are going to be going for Civics, uh, they're probably going to be going for Fireblades, so <laughs> I, I, I pity the people in the Woking area who have to pick motorcycle wreckage out of <laughs> the, the The Fireblade is the fast and scary motorbike, and uh, especially <laughs> being mounted by someone who's only just got one on the company scheme because they didn't want to drive a Civic. I think I'd probably take the Civic. Um, Christian, have you got a question for Codders? Don't worry if you haven't, but if you've got something you'd like to ask, far away. Well, I, I did think I had one at one point, but, but I forgot about it now. So. Don't worry, worry, don't worry. <laughs> Just flag, if you've got a question, raise your hand, children. Um, and Philip, what about you? Have you got anything you'd like to ask Collis? Uh, maybe um, based on what we have seen in the testing, um, what is his prediction for the top three in Australia? Oh, right. Um, okay, well, I will... Uh, uh, I don't want to sound biased, because, of course, on the internet these days, people always like to think journalists are biased. I would quite like Nico Rosberg to win, simply because I put 40 quid on him at the beginning of the <laughs> <laughs> Well, that definitely makes sense. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that would be good. That would be good. Um, I, I think, yeah, it, it could be between McLaren and Mercedes. Um, I, I was thinking that possibly Red Bull would be able to get on top of the issues that they've had but at the moment it's not looking like that's going to happen for a while so yeah I, I think um, it's going to be maybe McLaren, Mercedes, Force India could get in there, um, Williams it's possible, Felipe Massa uh, might be able to yeah. spring something because you know the, it, it's by no means a given that the McLarens will, uh, so the Mercedes engines will run as reliably as they have been throughout a Grand Prix distance. So uh, it could be you know, back to what we might say the old days of um, only half a dozen cars finishing Grand Prix and uh, people limping home and uh, just about scraping into the top ten and, and banking a few points that way. It's also quite nice, actually, when you're listing off your predictions there, Codders, it's not just, oh, well, it'll be Red Bull 1 and 2, uh, and it's just, it's quite fun now to have a few different names thrown into the mix, you know, even mentioning Force India for a podium, or Williams, it's sort of, it's been out of the question over the last couple of years, Williams especially. Yeah, we, uh, the, the, being massively selfish, the, uh, the, um, the ABC figures were released a few weeks ago, the, our, our circulation figures, and, and we, we'd been sort of going uh, about <laughs> what they might be like, uh, given that Formula One, one uh, as, as a whole has lost something like 50 million viewers. Uh, worldwide uh, last year, uh, and we we were kind of worried that you know, re regardless of our attempts to come just some excitement month by month, um, people would just be getting a little bit bored with um, Sebastian Vettel winning every race. And believe you me, we were getting bored having to write the reports. It was kind of past the parcel. Um, whoever was at the Grand Prix, uh, how, how do I make this one sound interesting? Uh, as, as you, as you can find. You've done it again. <laughs> uh, so yeah, That's we, how I tried to. We, we were a little bit. Um, we, we, I won't say we're pleased to see Red Bull struggling, but we are very pleased to see other people um, showing that they, they might do well. Uh, a little bit of unpredictability does help because it's good for box office. Because I, I don't know about you, there, there are some Grand Prix towards the end of last year where if, if I, if um, enough of that, you two. <laughs> Sorry, the cats. Uh, <laughs> the cats are lobbying for their E I N N E R. Um, uh, 
uh, and, and misbehaving. Yeah, there, there were some points last year where if Formula One didn't pay for the house I now sit in, I would probably have gone off and done something different on a Sunday afternoon if I wasn't, in actual fact, at the race itself. So there was no bums on seats is, is a good no, thing. No moment of, like, if you wanted to go to Lou during Grand Prix, you weren't thinking, like, oh, my God, I'm going to miss something, I'm going to miss something. You quite happily just go put the kettle on, go to the Lou, pop out to the shop, come back, and it was pretty much the same, wasn't it? Yeah, although there were some moments last year where I popped off to make a cup of tea and um, the uh, came back and, and weird stuff was happening and then he spat my tea out. But uh, there was um, I'll, I'll, there was there was a very weird moment at the Japanese Grand Prix last year, um, which, which I was actually at. I went out and did Korea Japan back to back. For the you lucky thing. You got um, a lucky deal there, didn't you? Very, very lucky deal. Well, I, I don't know. My my hotel room in Korea did not have a shower curtain. <laughs> uh, they, uh, I, I left traps around. They didn't let any. They didn't let the room out while I was away. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Some people in previous years. Yeah. But um, there was um, there, the 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 Japanese Grand Prix did unfolded fairly predictably it was not a thrill a minute uh, for, for at least half the race so it was just a question of watching it tick over and uh, the most exciting thing that for me that happened during that Grand Prix was um, one of the other denizens of the press room running to the toilet as if uh, he was desperate to get there and back as quick as possible he might miss something riveting and then um, on his way back deciding, actually, I fancy some water from the water machine. So he picked up, picked up his thing of water, filled it, and then ran back through the press room, so spilling it all over the place and you know, clipping people like they were apexes. And going, oh. Oh. The, you know, the, the media are crazy. What are you taking, chum? <laughs> um, my memory in Austin was people watching a football match while the Grand Prix was going on. And that's media, F1 media watching football during a race. I thought that really summed the season up. Yeah, I think I, I, I might have been doing so. I, I, uh, I Sky Plus that and watched it on Times 2, I've got to confess. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's a sign of the times. I was interested to see or to hear you say that Nico Rosberg has won your tipping for the win in, in Melbourne. A lot of people saying the Mercedes are going to be strong, but not being able to decide either way, Nico or Lewis. Is it definitely Nico for you then, Codders? Well, I put the forty quid on because Nico was sixteen to one. You know, you may as well. And uh, well, we we haven't really seen how Lewis performs over a race distance uh, with the new technical package as it is. And of course, the the thing with Lewis has always been he finds it very difficult to drive slowly, which is quite a good thing in a racing driver, you would expect. But um, with with the with, with the hundred kilo fuel limit and the and the fuel flow limitations, there are going to be times when the cars aren't driving as quickly as as they might possibly be. And Lewis t does tend to get quite frustrated when he's driving to the delta and being told by his engineer um, to you know back off the harvesting in such and such a corner or lift and coast into another corner. You get the, uh, just let me drive man uh, yeah. going on. Uh, and <laughs> fair play to being a racer in the Sterling Moss model. But the, the, there are question marks over whether he can you know, manage, manage the car over a race stint, whereas Nico is a very intelligent racer. He can multitask. Uh, in, in our previous issue, we featured him juggling on a unicycle, which uh, to illustrate just that very thing. So um, he's certainly got what it takes. He's, he's not ultimately as quick as Lewis, but um, this year it's not going to be about being the fastest driver every single lap. And Max Chilson said something very interesting to me, that um, you might see some tactics that uh, have come over from cycling, where in, in the pro peloton they all race in a group, because if you're... Um, pedaling in someone's slipstream, um, mm. it's much easier because they're, they're bursting the hole in the air and you expend 30% less energy um, pedaling your bicycle if you're in a big group uh, behind a group of other people. All you have to do is not hit their back wheel. So you might see some races where drivers quite happily let someone take the front and they just sit in the hole in the air, save energy that way, so they've potentially got more energy to go quickly later in the race. Because if you're, I think the word was greedy, uh, Max put it, and um, turn up the um, energy recovery and, and, and deploy all, uh, everything you've got, 
you're going to have to slow down for three or four laps to kind of recoup the energy and get yourself back into line. So that's kind of like a, a weapon of last resort to crank up the boost. So the, it, tactically, it's going to be very interesting this year. That's very interesting, using the peloton as the, uh, the idea for how they might race. That's very interesting. I was quite interested to hear how Lewis was braking much later, going into corners already today, already pushing the cars. He, you're saying how you know he loves to drive fast. For me, I would put Lewis over Nico, just because I think he does have that kind of challenging racer spirit over Nico. Well, either, either one of them wins, it's a good news story because it's a different face. And I think it would be good if Lewis won a few more races because he won the Hungarian Grand Prix. He, he just basically seems to own Hungary, even if he uh, uh, d doesn't have necessarily the best car. You've seen him perform there uh, time after time, year after year. So, uh, you know, there are some similarities between Hungary and Melbourne in terms of the stoppy startiness and the way the, the surface comes to the car uh, over the course of the weekend. So we, we, we might just see Lewis shine uh, in, in Melbourne. Uh, and this will definitely get me off my delta towards earning my mega bucks uh, <laughs> this year. Yeah, the drinks won't be on you if, if Lewis wins. Um, one last question from me, and then I'll ask the people another if they want to have another question. Everybody's been talking about the cost cutting, and I was interested to read an article on Autosport about um, the human resources side. A lot of the teams are shipping in two separate crews, so they're doing sort of shift systems. Do you think they're all going to be burned out by Melbourne? You know, usually three quarters of the way through the season, people start to look tired, but they are absolutely working them to the bone at the moment. Do you think there's a risk of any mistakes happening because crews are so tired? Yeah, the um, back end of last year was absolutely insane. And just from from memory, um, the back end of this year has got an awful lot of flyaways. And um, it, it is it is tricky because when you, you know, as a, as a seasoned traveller, you'll be aware of this. Um, um, you guys sitting at home probably thinking, yeah, smallest violin in the world. People come yeah. <laughs> down, down. Uh, but the, the mechanics particularly, they travel in economy. Um, so, you, you know, narrow pitch seats. Um, and when you're going on a flyaway, it, you are spending a lot of time in a very small metal tube crunched in. Uh, not necessarily developing deep, deep vein thrombosis. But yeah, I think it's, 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 it's not a great environment. You, your poor coccyx ache when you get to my age and uh, you, you, your bottom hurts for a couple of days after landing. So, um, uh, And you're exposed to other people's germs, so your, your, your resistance to illness comes down. So it, it, is quite, um, it is quite tiring, naturally fatiguing. Uh, for them, and of course they they they've got to hit the ground running. They've got to get there. The the FIA did bring in the curfew um, a couple of seasons ago, so they, they they don't have to work through the night. But if there's a lot of work to do, then they still have to do it. They just have to stop working when the curfew starts and come back in when 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 the curfew is over. So there's not less work to do. Um, they just have to be. They just have to work harder in the hours they have. So yeah, it is. It is very tiring. It, it's it's interesting to see the physical changes in the mechanics uh, uh, just just in the past few years. Because I I went away uh, to do freelance work for about four seasons, so I, I didn't go to many Grand Prix, and I used to run the tracks um, and jog around them with Claire Williams and uh, uh, the. BBC pit lane reporter Tom Clarkson uh, a couple of times in a Grand Prix weekend, and it would basically be just us. Uh, you wouldn't see anyone else running around the circuit. It's all changed. That's uh, all changed. Yeah, four, four years on, four or five years on, um, every um, every night you see people running the circuit, and UBS do that thing where they sponsor people and pay a uh, hundred dollars per person per lap uh, into Wins for Life or whatever charity it is. Uh, and it is amazing the people you see, you see mechanics keeping themselves fit, you see the people, yeah, the, um, the Molina, the scary bloke with the, with the goatee beard who ushers them onto the podium. He's quite a fast runner. He he comes past, um, comes steaming through, and you kind of jokingly say, "You get you getting ready for if you have to chase after any more Greenpeace uh, <laughs> this night." Uh, but yeah, so that they they do try and keep themselves fit. Um, there's less of the kind of after hours drinking culture. Less so of becoming a bit more. I think they they are much more aware of um, of keeping themselves healthy than they used to be. Definitely. 
It's a bit more like the NASCAR guys. I remember when we were out for Daytona 500 last year, you see them all on the floor stretching and doing all sorts of squats and things while they're waiting because, of course, with the fueling, they've got those big tanks and stuff. So it's a bit more like they're becoming like a NASCAR pit crew. And, and NASCAR have a race every week, pretty much, don't they? So uh, you know, they, they, they're on the road from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Uh, and so in that way, in that case, in that way, the Formula One people don't really know what it's like, but um, at least you know when you're crisscrossing America, you are doing just that. You're crisscrossing America. You're not say going from Abu Dhabi to um, into Lagos over the yeah. course of a few days uh, in, in, in a tin box. And certainly, you know, looking at I'm, I'm going to Australia. I'm flying Etihad via Abu Dhabi because um, obviously the magazine business. We're as poor as church mice these days. You have to take the cheapest flight and. Um, what about Royal Brunei? They could have done you a great deal, I'm sure. Oh, um, 560 quid gets you uh, to Melbourne on Etihad via Abu Dhabi. And oh, uh, the, the leg between Abu Dhabi and Melbourne is a murderous 14 hours. So you, you do need to come up with a survival strategy for that. Fortunately, the iPad has been invented, uh, which is great. So you can just sit and watch films or play uh, XCOM, provided they've... Um, erase the bug that makes it crash unpredictably halfway through the game. Oh, oh no, well, you need to get all your software issues sorted, like, like Red Bull do as well, I think. Um, I was interested actually to see that Jensen Button signed up all his mechanics for his triathlon in July. So he's trying to get, he's sort of trying to bring the F1 fitness right into McLaren. Yeah, McLaren, um, they're very competitive guys, so it's no surprise to see them doing that. So, it, it, it's quite, some, some fitter than others. I did a, uh, but a couple of years ago now, I did a mountain bike enduro race just local to me uh, with uh, a few guys. Um, the uh, with Andy Stobart from Lotus, Lotus um, yeah. guys. He's into his biking. Um, um, you, you may recognise. He was the guy who used to stand in the background holding Kimmy's umbrella for him. I'm not sure who will be holding the umbrella for this year. He yeah. looks a tiny um, bit like Kimmy. <laughs> he did. He was, they're gone all right. Uh, but yeah, Andy brought along uh, a few guys from McLaren to do it, and apparently there's, there was a big cheese from McLaren did it as well, who, who I didn't see, but. Um, uh, at that point, Andy had spent the whole winter in Barbados drinking, so he was slowly. I overtook him, and uh, I, I also, as as I came through to finish my second lap, and the two hours was up, and I was kind of thinking, I could I could just about do another hour, but it's lunchtime, and I'm hungry, so I'm going home. I saw the McLaren guys had actually packed up and were, had already gone, so they'd only done one lap. So hopefully they'll be a bit fitter sneaky. than that. They're going to do a triathlon because um, very sneaky. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I can't swim, so you wouldn't catch me doing that. <laughs> well, don't worry. We won't be asking you to swim. Um, Connors, thank you so much for joining us. Has anyone got any last questions before we uh, end today's lovely hangout? Philip, have you got a question? Yeah, maybe. Um, what uh, the scholars think about the new rule in 2015 when the tire heaters will be uh, cancelled? Good question. Oh, sure. Can you say that again? Because I, I didn't quite um, catch that one. Um, about the new rule in 2015 when the tyre heaters will be cancelled. Ah, uh, yeah, well... No warming of the tyres. Yeah. Uh, that'll be interesting because, um, as we know, cold tyres are a recipe for uh, slip sliding away. And, <laughs> yeah. um, some, some drivers more than others. And... Um, I, I tell you, the um, if you go um, karting and uh, you go out of the pits uh, on a set of cold tyres, you know about it, and that's just with a go kart with a lawnmower engine in. So what it's like with um, seven or eight hundred brake horsepower trying to spin those back wheels? It is going to be um, precipitous, is the word. So um, yeah, that 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 should be quite fun. We might see a few crap falls, and it will make it more exciting. Uh, there there is a probably a safety issue as well. So um, it's not nailed down just yet that they will make the change because. Formula One rulemaking is a movable feast, and we, we're seeing a long process. Yeah, and and very often things get proposed and then they disappear, and you never know until that y your inbox pings and it's a communique from the FIA saying here are the sporting regulations, and it's a 
2,000 page document which they handily marked the new um, rules or amended rules in red ink in uh, digital red ink and you have to go through page after page going, oh, the, 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 there's, there's that rule they mentioned the other year that they never got round to doing or you look at the thing, actually such and such a rule that they said they were going to do, they haven't done. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll see if it happens. It would be nice. It'll certainly make it interesting. I think anything that makes it more fun and more spectacular for us as fans and what we might laughingly call professionals working in the sport would be uh, a very good thing. <laughs> um, and Christian, have you got a final question for Codders? Yeah, I would like to hear um, what you think about the regulation about the engines, like the limit of numbers you can use. For 2014, when there's that big uh, change. Yeah, um, I, hmm, I, I I like new stuff, and I like anything that kind of shakes up the order. I haven't heard what the engines sound like yet. Um, by all means, by, by everything I've heard from people who've been at the two tests so far, they say they sound great. Um, so. Uh, I'm prepared to be impressed. In terms of the, um, the limitations that have been put on them, in terms of the fuel flow and um, the number of units that they can use every through the season, I think that is, that, that's by necessity uh, these days because the sport has to show some sort of leadership in, in a world where we're, our natural resources are declining. The, the oil is, um, there's less of it and it's buried under um, various quite unplace, unpleasant places uh, that it, it makes it hard to find and get at. So um, we, we need to justify as a sport, we need to kind of justify our existence. You can't assume that Formula One will always continue to happen the way it has been because um, the, the world is changing and, and we have to stay in step with that. So anything that can show to um, automotive manufacturers that actually it's a great idea to get involved in Formula 1 is, is, is a good thing and it's certainly looking like um, the performance of the car so far hasn't dropped that much. We're already, we've, we've seen um, someone do a lap that is quicker than Sebastian Vettel's fastest lap of Bahrain uh, in, the, in the Grand Prix last year and, and we're not and even... That was in a Force India. Mm. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, it's 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 a double thumbs up from me so far this year. Good, good, double thumbs up. And finally, from you, Scott, have you got a final question for the Codders? Yeah, I've been milling over this one. It's kind of a two-part question, really. Um, the first part, I wanted to get Codders' views on the news that Arden and Red Bull have signed up the GC Academy winner Jan Mardenbrook to a race in GP3 this season, which looks quite promising. And the second part related onto that was is that um, also we have incentives like GT Academy. I know that Carl and they've recently done something with the Let's Race Centre to have uh, give a prize for someone to test drive one of their Formula 3 cars. Um, and I know people who are friends through sim racing who have um, more recently had opportunities to test drive carts and Formula 3 and Formula 4 cars potentially. I wanted to get his opinion on whether or not this medium of racing virtually in the next few years, if it keeps expanding, could be a genuine path into any form of motorsport or where if someone can't afford to go karting or can't afford to go grassroots racing for real, they can at least learn the basics of driving a car on a circuit or driving on a rally stage through, you know, via a PC or a PlayStation as technology is advancing in that in that direction. They are getting more and more realistic and that's what we hear from um, team people and drivers when you ask them sort of, you know, how, how close is the simulation to a real thing? And they say, apart from the G-forces and things like that, they are very, very close. Uh, not everyone enjoys that. Um, we have Lucas Montezemolo of Ferrari on record as saying that he doesn't think much of simulators at all. He thinks it's ghastly. He doesn't want to sound like an old stick in the mud, but it's ghastly modern technology, and he wants to develop his cars on asphalt because that's what cars run on. Um, me, uh, I, I used to enjoy racing games, but they are so hard nowadays. Um, the, we actually had um, the um, which is it? Gran Turismo Five we're up to or four? Uh, six, six. We had yeah. The um, they, they came and demonstrated Gran Turismo Six um, in the photo studio downstairs from our office, and they brought Jan Mardenbro with them. Uh, Sony and I, I had to go on this virtual brand's hatch. I couldn't keep the car in a straight line. Uh, I didn't know where to brake. Um, uh, I, I said, um, no offence mate, but I prefer Mario Kart. 
uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I just I, with a lot of practice, you could summon the finesse um, to um, drive a car quickly in in a sim environment. And um, certainly, um, Lewis Hamilton was the first driver of the sim generation who perfected his craft as, uh, in, in terms of Formula One on the simulator. He did so many virtual miles before he got in that Formula One car for the first time, and, and that was what helped him make the most of his natural talent. And of course, I, I don't think um, uh, pra practice does make perfect, but um, I, I don't think you're going to turn yourself from a slow driver into a fast one by using a simulator, but you, you certainly can um, find potential within yourself um, by, by using a simulator. And, and as we found with Jan, he was quick in the virtual world and um, he's quick in the real world as well. Scott, we could see you on the podium sometime soon if you carry on your sim. Well, I, I did... Um Back at the All Sports Show, which also I know I met you there at um, sure All did. Sports Show, that? and uh, met you a couple of times. Um, how's how's the hand, by the way? I know you <gasps> injured your Much hand. Much better. Really. Look, good. No cast. Awesome. Hello. I know I shook that by accident. I shook and thought, oh, you've got your hand. <laughs> May have heard that. But um, it, um, I had to go on the, <laughs> I had to go on the. Um, they had a couple of Grand Tourismo six stands up there, and the first. I did. Um, I actually they had competitions where the fastest time by 5 p.m. got a copy, and um, I. On the Saturday, I was fortunate enough to win the Saturday competition, so I got, a, got that one. And I did the um, the Sunday one, and it was on like this little Red Bull Junior thing. It's like a Formula Three shaped kind of car, but it's kind of it's all kind of like it's all done how an extreme version of an F3 car would be. It's very aerodynamic with lots of grip in the corners, and I got third fastest time or something on that and the guy actually said to me you should probably try, G try GT Academy and I was like I would if I had the actual ability to set everything up properly I've got all the kit I just don't know where to set it up so who knows and you need to find a you've got a man cave the, the thing is that where I live I live with my dad and the size of the house you could the man cave is out of the question I mean if, oh. unless you want to clear unless you want to clear out the shed which is probably just like just full of I don't know what I haven't been in there ever since don't I lived there. there that's a bad thing yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to go there's probably full of spiders and stuff but, no, <laughs> try, but. Um, but no I mean I've done a few things with sim racing I mean I've like I said I commentate a lot on sim racing broadcasts is how I've gained experience as a commentation presenter um, I did I did a few things I won a few sims and stuff I did one at the British Touring Cars at Sneston last year, which is on the Genesta stand, and they had Grand Turismo 5 going, and um, I think my fastest time was only half a second off. Um, it was a Genesta GT Super Cup driver. Um, I know that sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm really not. I'm not anywhere near the capability of driving a real Genesta supercar. But um, it's just... yourself down. You never know. You can take that opportunity if it ever comes. Get in a real car. Yeah, unless you try, um, you, you never know, do you? Exactly. That's, that's true. I mean, I, a friend of mine... Um, uh, he's like I said, one of the friends of mine. He's currently testing. He, he did some stuff for the Autosport show. Worked on his kart sim, and they he broke the lap record on this casting sim. And they were so impressed, they invited him down this week to Buckmore Park to do some testing in a oh, in a cool. go kart and stuff. So he's now down there. Um, I think on the first day when he was he's only four tenths off the track record in that kind of class of kart, and he's only ever done sim racing. He's about 16 years old, so and he's quick and he know he knows what he's talking about. So. He's really good. So I think it's good, and the Formula One drivers say it's you know a way to familiarise themselves if they're rookies and they've not been on the circuit before, and I think it can be definitely useful in that way. Absolutely. I mean, Fernando Alonso did it too back 2005. He practiced the Istanbul track by playing the official Formula One game, and mm -hmm. of course he went on and uh, um, finished finished well. If I believe, I don't think he won. I think it was yeah, Raikkonen won that race. I seem to remember that was the race where Raikkonen won, and Montoya got to taken out by. Montero on the last lap and the Jordan got rear-ended. So, um, this, this is good recollection. I always have very to. Very good recollection. <laughs> this, this, that's the thing about it. in terms of knowledge. I think this, this little bits of information. I just think I, I might miss big bits like whoever won a championship 30 years ago. But if there's little events in a race. I think remember that. I never know when it might be useful. Some hey. pu some random pub quiz might come up or something. Well, I'm looking forward to lots of events this year coming up on Grand Prix. That's something to look forward to. At least maybe some explosions or some smoke. Um, thank you everybody so much for joining our hangout, especially to our newcomers. Scott, obviously, we knew before, and Wallace have been in touch. Philip, thank you very much as well. Big thank you to Codders. Very kind of you, because it's been a long hangout. Uh, um, it's been fun, although I, yeah, uh, there, there is a wailing from downstairs that suggests there is a hungry cat who's waiting for D-I-N-N-E-R. Yeah, <laughs> don't mention the word, don't mention the word. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. If you want to watch the hangout back, it'll be up on the channel on Pole Position. And, of course, just keep an eye on our Facebook.
Facebook, our Twitter. And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe because there's going to be so much more motorsport content coming. We've had interviews with Sterling Moss recently, so that will be on the channel. We've got a tour at Caterham coming up. So, yes, keep your eye on the channel. And thank you very much to everyone for joining the Hangout. See you all soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>